Praise the Lord. So good to see you this evening. Let's all stand together. And please, Brother Mary, would you ask the Lord to bless our service? Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to give you your word, Lord. Yes. To just give you praise and glory, Lord. And as our pastor Roger brings the word to us, Lord, that, that there be a special anointing upon him. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I found a new way of living.
joy shall ye draw water.
that we will be taking a look at this evening. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord God, for that promise, as we just heard. You are able to deliver us. And we thank you, dear Lord Jesus, that we can come to you in faith believing, not only for ourselves, but we can bring others before you in prayer. And God, that you hear our prayers. And Lord, I believe, as we believe, Lord, that you answer our prayers. I thank you, Lord, that you know the best answer. And Father, help me to put my faith and trust in you. And as we look to the word this evening, help us, dear Lord Jesus, to take from it, Father, what you have intended. May it, dear Lord Jesus, touch each and every one of us, our different situations, our different um, situations that we are living in with family, work, etc. Lord God, that you are here to meet each and every need. There is nothing that is impossible to you. We thank you for answers to prayer. And we want to, dear Lord Jesus, continue to praise your name and give you praise and honor and glory for you're the one that makes all of these things possible. And so, dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for the word that you've provided. May it be a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Very important that not only we make our prayer requests, but that we uh, let each other know how things are going. Uh, you will recall that we had uh, made special requests for Elizabeth down in Mexico. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, things weren't going so well. Um, our sister Glenda wrote that she was, uh, a sister Elizabeth was suffering from heart pain and pain in her lungs from when she was trying to breathe, etc. But praise the Lord, that has passed. Um, and uh, Sister Glenda said she's doing much better. The pain is all gone. Uh, and so continue to pray uh, and believe um, because God is able. Praise the Lord. Uh, turn with me, please, to Exodus chapter 32. We're going to begin um, by looking at an example of something the Lord laid upon my heart. Uh, it's something that is uh, a great danger in the world that we live in today. Actually, I have to take that back. It was a great danger in the world, uh, actually, from the very, very beginning. Um, but we're going to take a look at what happens here in chapter 32 of Exodus as an example of something that we must uh, constantly be on the alert so that it does not creep into our Christian lives, does not become part of our Christian culture, behavior, um, doctrine, any of those things, uh, because what we're going to take a look at um, is the idea of consequences. Now, we've spoken a lot about, you know, the fact that we make lots of choices, and we know that choices lead to consequences. Um, and we want to take a look here in Exodus chapter 32. We're just going to selectively pick out some verses rather than read the entire chapter. Uh, but here we have a situation where Aaron has created the golden calf. And we want to see how there are consequences for the behaviors of people. And jumping ahead a little bit, but putting this thought into your hearts and minds... As we look at what the Bible says to us about the responsibility of our actions and accepting that there will be consequences, positive and or negative, for our actions, we have to, as God's people, not push that away, but rather see that as part of God's plan. Because what we see in the world today is society... And I'm generalizing here a little bit, but certainly I think it's rather rampant, where we have people that are not willing to accept any of the consequences of their actions or behaviors. Um, and as a matter of fact, are seemingly, it looks to me at least, uh, trying to create more and more situations where there won't be any consequences, or at least they're trying to push them away. I'll give you an example. I've got something just very quickly to share with you uh, because I want you to see that this is not just something that you or I that we're making up, that statistically we can show that this is in fact happening. And we must not, I believe, 
have this creep into the way we approach our Christian lives. Because the Bible clearly makes it very, very clear that our actions have consequences. And part of the reason for this, of course, this is what I think, uh, this is part of God's plan, that right from very, very early on, when we're growing up, we have to recognize that everything we do as children, and we figure this out very quickly, right? If you do something that causes you to fall, there's going to be a little bit of pain attached to that, you know, and I can give you example after example after example, um, you know, putting your hand on something hot or, or anything of that nature. We know there is, in, in the way God has set up our lives and the world, there is always a consequence. Always a consequence. To deny that is really to deny God's plan and places us in this fantasy kind of a land that the world, I think the people of the world that are not saved, they want to dwell there. They don't want to think about their consequences of their actions and unfortunately that's being supported more and more by all kind of politicians, by the legal system, you name it. It's uh, all sort of moving in that direction. Even the healthcare system seems to be moving in that direction, um, trying to uh, get rid of the consequences of people's actions. Well, in this example, Exodus 32, Here's what we see, and I want to point this out to you. And what you're going to see are not only consequences as um, dictated by man, in this case Moses, but there are also consequences that come from God. Okay? And man's consequences, they adjust, they change, um, people have you know, emotions attached and all those things, and we are not good judges, you and I. Our, our, all kinds of things get in our way. But God, we know, is a righteous judge. And God doesn't, is not hindered by all of the same things that you and I might be hindered with. And so we're going to see what Moses says to do, which does happen. And then we're going to see what God says to do. And as God's people, not only should we be concerned about what the world might do or what the world's laws are, but we also mostly have to be concerned about what God says is going to be the consequence attached to our actions. Chapter 32, verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us, for as for, as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in your ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, these be thy gods, sorry, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Now, there's all kinds of, all kinds of things there, and I, I hope, you know, as we read that, there might be some things there that you want to go back and read again, because the words are very important, and what happens is really, really important, but suffice it to say, the people commit sin, okay? So now, when we jump down to verses 19 and 20, what do we see? We see a consequence, and it came to pass... 
as soon as they came nigh unto the camp, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. So already we're seeing some consequences, some punishments here coming from Moses. Jump down to verse 25. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell at the people that day about three thousand men. Quite a punishment. Jumping down to verses 33 to 35. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore go now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, my angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people, because they made the calf which Aaron made. Quite a series of consequences. Consequences, of course, simply being the result or effect of an action. Okay? <coughs> Whatever it might happen to be. So here the action is sin. And we don't see that overlooked. We see that there are consequences that Moses dictates, first of all. Then we see sort of in the middle uh, where it speaks here uh, that the Lord of, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, in verse 27. So we have God sending a message through Moses, and we see uh, the killing, really, um, of uh, those that uh, committed the sin. And then, the most important, we see in verse 33, where we see the Lord saying, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. So there are consequences for our actions that happen in the here and now. But most importantly, there are consequences for our actions that are eternal. And as God's people we have to learn and remember that our actions, whatever they might happen to be, must not be overlooked. They can be forgiven, but even things that are forgiven, there's a price that has to be paid. And this is something, again, that the world doesn't like to hear. I can't tell you the number of times I had students in my office and all they were saying is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And perhaps, and quite often, I trust that they were. However, that does not take away the action that took place. That does not take away the fact that there is going to be a consequence for the action that took place. And the world today seems to be, this seems to be the solution to all of their problems, is we'll push it under the rug, we'll pretend it never happened, don't worry, there's no consequence that we're going to attach to it, everything will be fine. That's not the way the Lord set things up. I mean, I, I'm not reading, but, you know, we've gone a number of times lately back to Genesis, and all we have to do is look at Adam and Eve, who were told not to do something, were told there would be a consequence, did it anyway, choose to blame others, right? Well, Lord, you know, it's the woman you gave me. 
etc., etc., right? We see this whole thing of not being responsible for their actions and wanting to push it off to somebody else right away, okay? And this seems to have become an extreme these days. And what came to my attention, just to sort of reflect on this and, and to demonstrate, you can find this online, this is public information, but I saw a couple weeks ago now, um, just a quick summary of the number of crimes, so they're defined as crimes in our legal system such as it is, all right? They're defined as crimes, but the number of crimes that though the person is caught, though the person is, um, you know, has been said to have committed the crime, the number of crimes, the percentage of these crimes that never make it to court, that are dismissed or stay before they get to trial, they're withdrawn, even though they were a crime. And so the person that commits the crime, there's never a consequence. And I was shocked. And you can get these statistics, I did it just for Ontario, but then you can go locally, so I have Kitchener and I have, and you have to look at them carefully, but just, just bear with me for a moment. So, in Canada, in a year's time, these are current from July 2020, <coughs> excuse me, to June 2021. So this is very current, right? You don't get Statistics Canada numbers that are this current. Okay. In uh, Canada, according to this, there were 419 cases received in the court of homicide. Okay, 419 of them. Okay. There were 91 of those cases that were resolved before they went to trial. Now that might mean that the person um, confessed, they said they were guilty, so it never had to go to trial. Okay, so that number itself doesn't tell you too much. All right, but of the 91 that never went to trial, 76 of those were withdrawn or stayed, or in other words, there was no resolution whatsoever. So there are 76 people who committed homicide that never had a consequence, the way that I read this. Attempted murder, there were 133 people who never and they were charged with attempted murder. Robbery, 1,670 acts of robbery. And I can go on. Sexual assault, 1,071 sexual assaults, classified as sexual assault, that never went to trial, that were withdrawn before they went to trial, even though the person was charged. And then it goes on. There's major assault, common assault, theft, break and enter, it just goes on. For theft, 8,341 incidents of theft that just seem to have been swept away. No consequence. In Kitchener, the numbers are obviously, well, I shouldn't say that, hopefully smaller, but it's the same thing, okay? Five murdered homicide charges were withdrawn or stayed before they went to trial last year. Weapons charges, 57, were stayed. Impaired driving charges, 120, no consequence. Right? And the, the only reason, like the reason I'm sharing this with you is because the danger not only is what's happening in the world, but the danger is we cannot let that creep into our Christian life. That's the more important thing here. You see, we have to remember, and children need to be taught, and as adults, <coughs> we need to be taught, because there's this attitude that it's kind of connected to, it'll never happen to me. Okay? And <coughs> this idea that, well, 
if I sin, surely God will forgive me. Well, yes, the Bible says he will forgive. But we have to remember, and it's a preacher's job to preach, that there's still going to be a consequence. There's still going to be a price to pay. Just like all of these, you know, people who, who uh, you know, very, very quickly forgot about Moses. You know, I just love the language in verse 2 of chapter 32 there where we were. You know, where it says, For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. They, they just forgot all about what Moses had done. But more importantly, forgot that Moses was under the, the direction of God. And so, very quickly, they forget that. And quite possibly, when Moses comes on the scene, there are people, you know, that are trying to make excuses, you know, and they made me do this, etc., etc., etc. Well, we are responsible for our actions. And every action has a consequence. The Bible is very clear. Romans chapter 6. And you can go, really, from Genesis all the way through to the end of Revelation. And you can pick out, over and over and over again, this theme. Okay? But things where it says, in Romans 6 and 23, for the wages of sin is death. Okay? We, we have to, as God's people, recognize the wages of sin, or the consequence of sin, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. <clears throat> so, if you choose to go against God's plan, expect what God tells you is going to happen. It's not going to be like the world. I was quite disgusted. And you can do a lot more reading. I spent quite a bit of time this afternoon... You know, and they're using the pandemic now as an excuse, right? Because they're sort of saying, well, we couldn't hold all these court proceedings because everything was shut down. Now they're backlogged. You know, this is our amazing system in our country that we have, right? Now we're so backlogged. Why? Because there's so much sin. You wouldn't be backlogged if there wasn't. If people were following God's plan, yes, we fall, etc. But I mean, you wouldn't have this tremendous backlog. The one article I read talked about 6,000 impaired driving charges they're just going to throw out because they can't keep up. They don't have enough time. They don't have enough, I guess, <laughs> lawyers or judges or whatever to actually do the trial work. So they're just going to Take an eraser and say, shh, 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 for, oh, okay, look, now we're caught up. Hmm. I can, we can guarantee each other, I'm sure. That's not the way God's going to do it. Because the Lord keeps track of you and keeps track of me every moment of every day. And to that, we have to say thank you. Because God is there to remind us and stop us so that we don't have to deal with this ultimate consequence of death or eternal damnation, so that we have a chance to make our wrongs right and to actually have the gift of eternity that Jesus spoke of. Another example in uh, Galatians chapter 6. <coughs> Excuse me. Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You know, so, you know, you, you look and, and, you know, we could have debate over what should the consequence be. I'm not up here to have that debate with you at this point in time. I'm just suggesting there needs to be a consequence of some sort, right? Because you have all of these different charges here, you know, drug trafficking, 53 people got away with it scot-free. Well, why should they stop? Can anybody tell me why? 
they would stop unless the Lord come and change them. They're not going to stop. Perhaps you read in the news they just broke up in between Kitchener and it was Stratford and Cambridge and, I don't know, St. Mary's, you know, a big sort of uh, drug trafficking ring, a whole bunch of guns, 14 people charged, you know, and in the home, you know, they had $100,000 uh, items, you know, expensive watches and all kinds of things, all purchased because of the crime. It was like over, I think, close to $500,000 of cash, you know, that they had. You're not going to tell a person to stop doing that unless they get born again, unless they're saved. If, you, if they've now arrested those 14 people, and even if a few of them just walk away. The age was 25 to 51, so maybe I'm the judge and I feel sorry for the guy who's 25. Okay, you know, see ya. Don't do it again. That's not a consequence. And as much as we all perhaps want to believe that we can learn without consequences, I would argue, it appears to me, God made us so we learn by consequences. That's not saying they have to be severe, but there has to be something that sends a message A couple weeks ago, uh, Russell was fooling around around a campfire. The fire was out, and they doused it a couple times, and I guess there were rocks around it where they were, and he was sort of prancing around, lost his balance, fell right towards the ashes, put his hand in there. People had said to him, don't do it, don't do it, be careful, that might still be hot. When he came down, his hand went into the ashes. There was a consequence. I can guarantee you he's not going to do that again. Because that hurts if you've ever been burned. Right? And then we're more cautious. Now we want people to learn from the warning that's given. But that doesn't always work. And so sometimes we have to learn by a consequence. I know enough that there's a chance this bulb that's been on for a while might be hot. How do I know that? Because I've tried to change a few bulbs once in a while without letting them cool down. Perhaps you've done that too, right? And you kind of do it quick and you juggle the bulb a little bit or whatever. But we learn. That's not the smartest thing to do. Now, sometimes we're still foolish and we still try and do it. But there's a message in there somewhere where we figured out, well, this was not a smart thing to do. Okay? And so scripturally, what does it say? Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. As God's people, we can't change, nor should we want to change, the Word of God. And so if you make a mistake, I guarantee you there's going to be a consequence. I can also guarantee you that if you come with a clean heart and a right spirit and you ask the Lord to forgive you, that God will do that. But you still have to pay the price. And I say that because in Exodus, go back to Exodus 22, some might say, this is a little archaic, I would disagree, but in my Bible at the top, and I'm not going to read them all, because there are quite a few, it says, laws of restitution. Isn't that interesting? See, the Lord saw right from the very, very beginning, if you do something wrong, you have to try and fix. You need to do what makes it right. It's not enough to say, I'm sorry. That's a good beginning place. But there's also something else that has to be done. And so, in great detail, chapter 22 of Exodus speaks of different situations. Now, these situations, you know, 
I don't know, I haven't seen lately in the news too much about a man stealing an ox or a sheep or anything like that. I suppose it still happens, right? But here it's quite clear. If any man steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. The point here is, you've got to make your wrongs right. A consequence. Okay? And it goes on, right? It talks about, you know, um, uh, theft in verse 4. If the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be an ox or an ass or sheep, he shall restore double. See, the whole idea, what we see over and over in Scripture, is this idea of restoration and restitution. And the world today is moving further and further and further away from that. And what I'm worried about as a pastor is that the church pick up, and I'm not talking about this church, but I'm talking churches in general, right? We don't want it to happen in this church either. But churches in general, what I think I'm seeing is the worldly culture is coming in and influencing the Christian way rather than the Christians being strong, <coughs> pardon me, in the word of the Lord, holding fast and saying, no, we need to be praying because we're going to influence in the world, not the other way around. And so making excuses and, you know, and sort of pushing things under the rug over and over and over again. I mean, what you see here, you know, if I look, verse 5 ends up, shall he make restitution? The end of verse 6, shall surely make restitution. Okay, the end of verse 7, let him pay double. If only man in general followed God's plan. See, I think this would work. Actually, I know this would work. Because God set it up this way. Okay? But when we wander away from God's plan, things don't work. Can I give you one more example? It's an American example, but I'm sure it happens here too. There are some times, actually in courts, where the fine is also levied. Right? So there's some kind of a restitution required. Well, I was reading again today as I was doing some research. This happens to be San Francisco, and you can think what you want about San Francisco. But apparently, there are $96 million in unpaid restitution that's outstanding. Chances are they'll never find it. They'll never get it. Where the judge has said, Bad, bad, bad person, you need to pay that money back. Well, $96 million hasn't been paid back. And probably it'll just get written off. What does that say to people? What does that say to youth today? What does it say to adults today? Do we need to worry about getting caught committing a crime? Do I need to really worry? I mean, I didn't figure out the percentages, but some of them are pretty high. In the piece that I saw, it was like 56% of homicides are basically never make it to trial. 56, and that's homicide. I'm not talking about like jaywalking or, you know, what I would consider to be a minor sort of a thing. Well, if that's the case, and I know that, and people know that, I'm sure the criminals know that. I'm sure they know that. But what we have to remember, this is the, most, this is the big point, okay? Yes, that's the way the world is operating. Yes, we should find that disgusting. I do. You know, when I hear then about sexual assault and all those kind of things, and they never even make it to trial. And that's not, I'm not talking about now the ones that have to go to some other program. Okay, that's a completely step, separate statistic. I didn't even talk about that. And so whether you agree with these alternate programs or, or whatever, that's a whole other story, right? I'm talking strictly about the ones where they say, forget it, 
you're scot-free. You don't have to go to a program, you don't have to pay restitution, you don't have to do anything. Those are the numbers that I was sharing. Okay. And, and so when I see that, I'm disgusted. But let us never let that become part of our Christian walk. That's not God's plan. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? Do you see the warning? I'm, I'm calling it a warning because I think it's the Lord spoke to me about how important it is that God's people be separate. The Bible speaks of that. And that's in the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we think, the things we do. All has to line up with what God says how it has to happen. Okay? And so... These sin is not to be overlooked. Transgressions cannot be overlooked. If we come the right way, and restitution is made the way it's set up in the Bible, then these things are forgiven. And then they are to be, by the way, forgotten. And that's one sometimes we struggle with. But that's part of the scripture as well. Forgiven and then forgotten. Washed, covered by the blood. If we do it the right way. But it can't be overlooked. Because God's not going to overlook it. And so I don't do you a favor as a pastor to sort of turn a blind eye and pretend I don't see anything. Because you might think, oh, that wasn't a problem. But then when you get to the Lord's judgment, not only is the pastor going to be in trouble, but so are you. And so we have to be honest about what the scripture says. And we have to deal with it now while we still can, while God has given us the blessing and the opportunity to make our wrongs right and to live according to his there are consequences. But thank God, there is also mercy and blessing. So stand with me, please. <coughs> and as I'm thinking about that, I thank the Lord for the consequences of prayer. And as we saw with Elizabeth getting feeling better, and others that have seen an answer to prayer, see, if you don't pray, that also has a consequence. But if we pray, then the Lord hears and answers our prayer. And that is a positive consequence. So let's pray together tonight, thanking God for the opportunity to draw nigh to Him. And I thank God for His warnings. You know, He's always talking to me about being on guard. Because these things have a way of creeping in. Satan has a way of trying to get in. And then we overlook a little thing, we overlook this little thing, oh, that's not so bad, that's not so bad, that's not so bad. Well, that's the beginning of what's happening in our court system. Well, we'll only deal with the really bad things. And then the world decides what's the really bad thing. And all the other things. It's chaos, is what you end up with, all the other things. Let's not have chaos. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for a straight and narrow way. And it's a straight and narrow way that is not defined by what I like, or what a committee likes, or what a family wants. It's a straight and narrow way defined by God's Word, by what God has said, Lord, by what you have ordained to be the straight and narrow way. We've talked about standards. We've talked about choices. And we recognize that there are consequences that will not be overlooked. The wages of sin is death. Whatsoever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. All of this is God's ordained plan for how the world is to function and how we, as God's people, are to live. 
Father, we see round about us things going in the opposite direction. We know that. We see that. But I believe this week, dear Lord, you spoke to me and I've had a chance now to share. Father, the warning that we should not let this creep into our Christian lives. We can't overlook because I know, Lord, you do not overlook. And that's a good thing because you are a father that loves his children. You are a father that sees down the line what's going to happen if this or that is not dealt with. And Lord, in our society today, the only solution, the solution that has always been what we need, is Christ. Is a turning, a revival, a restoration of laws, a restoration of biblical principles, a restoration, dear Lord, of true love according to Scripture. Not one that overlooks sin, but one that deals with it and teaches so that that sin is something that people do not want to commit and don't feel that they're going to get away with it. Father, as God's people, we know, help us to remember, we will not get away with sin in our lives. Though our family might not know, though the church may not know, though the pastor may not see, matters not. For Lord, you see everything and everyone. So Lord, speak to our hearts, speak to mine, speak to my brother, speak to my sister. May we be thankful for you watching over us. And help us, dear Lord Jesus, to recognize we can make restitution. Our wrongs can be made right. And then, dear Lord Jesus, we can be set free. Free to worship. Free to truly walk with you. Be with us now as we pray. We thank you for answers to prayer. In our own lives, in our families, in our job situations, whatever it happens to be, in countries afar in the life of our sister Elizabeth and taking care of our sister Glenda and watching over our sister Harris in Jamaica and other missionaries, other Christians. Lord God, thank you for answering prayer. Thank you for the consequences that come along <coughs> with being faithful. As you bless the faithful, help us, dear Lord Jesus, to give you praise. I thank you in thy name. Amen.